Thanks everyone uh, for joining us this evening. My name is Tanya May and I'm the Director of Special Education here at the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction or OSPI. And I'm joined by a few of my colleagues tonight. Uh, we'll take just a moment to let them introduce themselves. Lee? Good evening everyone. My name is Lee Collier. I'm a Program Supervisor at OSPI in Olympia for Special Education Outcomes and Restraint and Isolation. Scott? Hi everyone, um, my name is Scott Robb and uh, I serve as the parent and community liaison uh, for the special education section uh, at OSPI. Great, thank you both. And thank you so much everyone for joining us. Tonight we're gonna be walking through some themes uh, around questions that we received in preparation for tonight's webinar. It's talking about supporting families across all learning models um, and thinking through some of the needs uh, around special education. So Tony walked us through some of this already. Um, this session is being recorded. It will be posted to our OSPI website and we have the link in there. Uh, I'm also gonna drop a link in the chat right now. So if you would like to have the slides handy uh, and follow along while we're uh, going through the webinar tonight, you have all of those, including the links. You can put your questions into the Q&A at any time. And for those of you who need lang uh, Spanish language support, we're very excited to be joined by Patricia Montes tonight. So thank you so much for being here with us. And then if you want live captioning to be um, on, you can click the CC button as well. So to start, those of us representing OSPI respectfully acknowledge that this state agency is located on the traditional lands of the Squaxin Island Nation, descendants of the maritime people who lived and prospered along the shores of the southernmost inlets of the Salish Sea. We make this acknowledgement to open a space of recognition, inclusion, and respect for our sovereign tribal partners and all indigenous students, families, and staff in our community. We also acknowledge the pain and trauma of these past several months and over 400 years of racism in the United States. We stand with our communities of color, especially those who identify as or are categorized as African-American. We also acknowledge the intersectionality of those who identify both as persons of color and individuals with disabilities. We commit to centering our work to dismantle systemic racism and disrupt ableist structures. We also center our work with the OSPI equity statement. Every student, family, and community possesses strengths and cultural knowledge that benefits their peers, educators, and schools. Ensuring educational equity goes beyond equality. It requires our education leaders to examine how current policies and practices result in disparate outcomes for students of color, students living in poverty, students receiving special education and English learner services, students who identify as LGBTQ+, and highly mobile student populations. It also requires our educational leaders to develop an understanding of historical context, engage our students, families, and community representatives as partners in decision-making, and actively dismantle systemic barriers, replacing them with policies and practices that ensure all students have access to the instruction and support they need to succeed in our schools. Our work is um, prioritized around these different uh, priorities for improving outcomes for students with disabilities. And these include leadership, 
maintaining a growth mindset, implementing evidence-based practices, providing professional development, thinking differently about resource allocation and focusing on recruitment and retention. So I want to thank everyone. Um, we, we received several questions in advance. Some people emailed directly. Um, some people submitted questions through the registration, and it was incredibly helpful. Um, it is absolutely fine to just add your questions as we talk this evening. Um, some of the themes that we heard from families uh, in preparation for tonight include these topics. In-person and remote learning learning recovery and inclusion, family supports, IEP planning and coordination across different systems and agencies, and then a little bit about oversight, special education monitoring. So we'll talk about that too. So to jump into our first section, um, I wanted to just begin by sharing a few of the themes of questions that we received around this. And something that, that was um, really striking to us is, is just the range of how people are feeling and thinking about in-person learning. Uh, we had uh, families who were very concerned about um, wanting in-person services to start right away, uh, if they haven't already, um, interested in who gets to decide how in-person uh, learning is, is implemented. Um, and then there was also the, the other end of the range, families who um, are nervous about sending their students uh, back to school in person and uh, wanting to make sure that if, if there are safety concerns, that their students can still receive services uh, while they're maintaining remote learning. So we wanted to start by framing how school reopening decisions are, are made. And so the Department of Health is tasked with looking at the safety requirements for students. And for, for our staff, um, staff safety, we work with the labor and industries. And so those two entities work together. They look at the, the transmission rates. They look at the guidance coming out from the federal government. And then they work together with, with OSPI as the state agency and then local school districts um, to make a decision about to what extent can a local school and school district open in person. And the Department of Health has been a, a, just a great partner in um, providing updated information. So this is a, a pretty recent update uh, to their in-person learning toolkit. And I know it's a screenshot, it, it can be a little hard to see, but they have guidelines um, on this chart for looking at transmission rates in a community and how, how those rates of transmission and some of the other um, activity levels that are happening in the, in the community can help a school system make a decision about to what extent can in-person learning be provided. And we have that hyperlink on this page. So if you have the slides, then you can, you can click on it. I wanna just pause for a minute. Um, Lee, did we work out the right link for the slides? My apologies if I shared the wrong it, one. It worked for me. It should bring up a download of a PDF. Um, it does not bring you to a website. Uh, that might be the confusion. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, if, if people do continue to have trouble, with it, uh, just keep letting us know and we'll, we'll try some different things. Can you, can you try to repost it in the chat every once in a while, Lee, so that people can see it if they're joining us a little bit later? Thank you, everyone. We have another uh, more recent uh, um, website and, and data set available to everyone. So this is the OSPI school reopening data. And this is being updated regularly. Schools are sharing where their systems are in terms of providing services, about whether uh, they're 100% remote, 
doing small groups and a mixture? Are they starting to phase in in person? Uh, are they doing partial for all students? Um, uh, or are, are they back to a more traditional model? And you can see, um, according to the color, what percentage they, they I'm, I'm sorry, what type of services are being provided, and then they have the percentages as well. These are the data for elementary. You can also look on that website for uh, middle school level and then also for high school. So for this next section, um, I'll, I'll walk us through this and then Lee, if there's any, um, any other items that you wanted to, to speak to, uh, just go ahead and jump in as, as we go. Um, as we were thinking about some of the questions around services and remote learning, we wanted to make sure that, that partners on the call tonight are aware of some of the guidance that our agency has, has been putting out. Some of the questions uh, asked us about how, how service minutes are being calculated right now when as students are still learning remotely. Uh, families had questions about how to best access services uh, as, as students are either fully remote or in a hybrid model uh, or going back into in person. There were also a few questions about paraeducator supports, uh, whether that might just be paraeducator supports in general or one-to-one -one supports. And then uh, asking a little bit about what are the requirements for providing services? Does it have to be with a special education teacher? Um, can it be a paraeducator? Can other staff help to support? So those were really helpful questions. Um, and we have a special education COVID page that's set up and it's, it's broken apart into different sections. And so one of the more recent resources that we have put out is, is a, a brief, it's, it's a, a, a shorter document, and it includes um, resources around guidance for in-person learning. And it includes multiple translations, if you need to look at that in another language. We also have a, a document, several documents uh, around online resources. So one is training for, for anyone, they're all free. Um, so it, it is targeted to school staff, uh, but also includes resources that can be available for community members and families. And then there's also uh, a whole source of online teaching resources. And those we've been gathering primarily to support students with disabilities as they're working online. It can be sorted or filtered by grade level, by um, subject area, and also by whether it's intended to support educators, students, uh, or parents and families. And all of these are linked uh, in the slides. We've also had a lot of requests to be very um, open and transparent and provide examples to the field as, as we're talking about the requirements. And so because of that, um, we've been developing case studies. And these are complete student-centered examples. We have a, a whole series of case studies on least restrictive environment. And that's really designed to help IEP teams know um, the answer to, to one of the questions that we received, which is how, how are IEPs supposed to show the differences between uh, it, virtual learning, in-person learning, or hybrid that has both. And so these case studies show for each one of these students that progression from, from school closure and having to transition to, to online learning, to, to moving into a hybrid model, uh, and then coming back to in-person services. And there's an elementary example, a middle school example that focuses on behavior, and then a transition uh, example for a student who's older um, and receiving transition services. We also have some resources to support high school and beyond planning. 
um, helping teams to align that high school and beyond plan and the IEP transition plan to support students who are getting ready to, um, to think about graduation or transitioning to post-school life. So right now, the case study for that that we've set out um, is, is for an adult student with significant disabilities uh, who is receiving transition services. And we, uh, over the next week or two, will post a second example that is a career and technical education um, case study for a student who is interested in studying graphic arts. So I wanted to walk us through a little bit about um, how we've been framing these messages. So this is a, a section, a few sections from our guidance for in-person learning. And what we're asking our schools to, to be thinking about is that as students are preparing now, for some of them to come back into in-person learning, could be for the first time in, in a year, um, is to really think about what additional supports might be needed to help with that transition back into school and into in-person learning. Also making sure that families have enough information and understand the health and safety precautions that the school is taking. Um, and that schools are thinking about ways to, to help the students transition back into the school building. Some examples that we can share that, that we have heard about school systems doing uh, some systems are, are uh, pre-recording videos, uh, just to welcoming videos to, to help the students see what the school looks like, um, to, to be reminded of the staff. Uh, they might go over some routines, and that's, those are videos that families can watch with their students uh, to help prepare students to be coming back into the building. We've also had a few questions about inclusion um, as, as students are coming back into the school building, especially thinking about for safety, if students have to be kept in small groups, how do we make sure that those groups aren't more segregated uh, and that students are losing uh, opportunities to be part of inclusive settings? And so we're asking schools to think about staff scheduling uh, and how services in the school are provided so that students still have uh, access to their peers and to core instruction. And it's also very important for staff to have time uh, to, to continue collaborating and planning across different content areas, uh, especially as we're thinking about some of these cohorts um, and how we can best make sure that students have access uh, to their peers and then also to their services. Lee, um, I'm going to cue you here to see if there's anything that you want to add to this section uh, about student engagement. Uh, I just pulled out one, one line from that section um, that we, we really want our schools to be thinking about something that's called universal screening. Uh, what type of data are they collecting on all students, uh, particularly about how students are doing with social emotional learning, um, if they're, they're dealing with trauma or from over this over the pandemic from being out of school um, from the just anxiety about transitioning back into the school system and to really think about what extra supports might need to be put in place yeah i think the thing to note is that we are we're really asking us uh, schools to be resources for communities that they haven't been previously. Yeah. And I think some of their interventions and some of their, uh, what they're trying to do may actually seem different than what it's been before, but we're really encouraging. And so our best practice is really encouraging our school district to think about kids holistically and ask about their families and their feelings and their emotions and their well being in a way they haven't before. And I think we're, we're encouraging partnership um, that we, we hope is seen as genuine and authentic. So I think it might, might feel a little different and I kind of hope it does. Thanks Lee. Uh, so I think I'll just pause there for a moment before we, we turn to this topic of, of learning recovery uh, and what recovery services might, might look like and how inclusion plays into that. 
Uh, Lee, was there anything uh, that stood out uh, around uh, specifically in-person or remote learning that we want to make sure we we talk about before we we shift a little bit? I think that um, this is a, this is a local issue in many ways, and and uh, we have a lot of questions about um, students not being able to access. Um, uh, remote learning and that being a problem. I think the thing to remind everyone is that um, the students, are, their IEP is still in place and they they, they still have all the rights uh, enabled in their IEP. And if they're not making progress, this is a conversation for their IEP team and uh, and to just get in. And, and there also, th there might be barriers because lo there's local health ordinances and, lo and local things going on that prevent in-person services. So these things are really different uh, region to region and, and district to district. So I think there's a lot of things in place there. Absolutely. Um, so we'll we'll go we'll go through this section on on recovery, uh, and then pause again because we may be able to dig into uh, some more uh, of the specific questions that are coming in tonight uh, once we've gone over that. And so I think Scott, you're gonna you're gonna help walk us through uh, some of these slides. Uh, so you and I will, will do this part together. Uh, before you start, I just wanted to talk a, a little bit about some of the themes that we got uh, in terms of questions for these sections. So under learning recovery and inclusion, um, some of the questions have been around um, what, what are some of the best practices around compensatory education for students who may need extra supports because of the pandemic? How can students miss uh, some of the time that they, their service time uh, because they were out or, or couldn't we're struggling to access remote instruction. We had a question about grading and, and how families can learn more about the grading systems. Um, there was a question specific to reading and, and we also had a few questions about dyslexia. And so I'm gonna follow up individually with those uh, because we really wanna make sure that we include our partners from the Dyslexia Council uh, in answering that. So we'll, we'll circle around to that one after tonight's webinar. And then um, the final question around the learning recovery was um, how are systems making decisions about to what extent might a student need recovery services? Thank you, Tanya. This is Scott speaking. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight again. Um, the first thing I'd like to mention is in particular, what do we mean? by recovery services, because that terminology may be new uh, to some of you listening. And you may have heard the term in the past, compensatory services or compensatory education being used in the past. So just to clarify terminology, compensatory education, that comes more out of a legal context, something where there's a situation where the school district may have been, or there's a acknowledgement really that something was out of compliance or wasn't done correctly. And so that's where the idea of compensatory services, compensatory education kind of grew out of that kind of legal context. Because we're in a unique situation now where learning loss and recovering from a pandemic is upon us, the idea that recovery services is perhaps something that we need to, we've created that term to perhaps capture the moment that we're in. But the real focus here, no matter what we're talking about, is how do we continue to meet the needs of a student who's on an IEP that still needs services? So the conversation is around how do we assess the student's current needs and essentially plan for some way to recover from this, the impacts of this experience. Some general things to keep in mind though, based on the questions we received about recovery services. They're not generally expected to be an exact one-to-one -one count, if you will, or minute or minute or hour for hour for something missed or time missed. What we really want to focus on is where is the greatest amount of learning lost or where is the greatest amount of need taking place as a result of what's happened and what makes sense in terms of 
trying to create a plan to recover from all that. And when making a plan, the schedule, if you will, for recovery services, an important consideration should be not leading to the student missing what they would generally general education services or special education services that are continuing to go on. Recovery services shouldn't necessarily displace any of that. Unless of course an IEP team feels that you know a different kind of decision needs to be made based on the severity of need. But the recovery services, as, as we kind of put this idea out there, um, should be made available to any, any student who needs it, both on an IEP and any recovery services that the district or recovering or learning loss that the district may be planning in general. You know, just the same that students who have an IEP should be able to access sort of general recovery that's maybe available, as well as anything that's specifically unique to their special education needs. So in, in my role, I receive a lot of questions, and this was one that I think kind of dovetails nicely into the questions we received in advance, because I think the natural question is when should I expect to get access to or start talking about recovery services with my school district. At the moment, there's no real deadline that's been set. And that would be very unworkable and difficult to do because we're still in the midst of trying to figure everything out. But at this point, if an IEP team determines it's necessary and wants to talk about recovery services, that's encouraged because the understanding is that yes, learning loss is occurring and continues to occur. And as districts move into a hybrid learning model or begin making more in-person services available, that may be the time when an IEP team thinks it's more appropriate to start discussing, can we do specific things to recover the learning loss? So there's the big takeaway is that there is no deadline but there's also no prohibition on talking about it right now. In fact, we would say it's encouraged to talk about it, even if that conversation is about how to plan for the future. Thanks, Scott. Before, yeah, before we move to the next, I, I did want to just make sure that, that our participants also know that um, Education in general right now, our, our school partners across the board are, are also thinking about this. Um, there are conversations happening um, at our state level, at our national level, uh, about the, the learning recovery needs of all students and how, how the, the pandemic may have impacted their ability to make progress um, in, a, in a variety of ways. And so, uh, you know, as we think about this um, from, from inclusive practices uh, perspective, we'll want to be thinking about that too and making sure that, that students with disabilities have access to those types of, of more general services in addition to what might be required specifically for their IEPs. Okay, this is Scott speaking again. If Another question that kind of connects with the rest of the questions we received, particularly around sort of monitoring the amount of learning loss and what do we do to begin to, to make, to address the, the lack of progress or the type of progress that has or has not been made. What can we do? So as we mentioned that recovery services are not currently like required to be implemented in any, with any sort of deadline or a certain amount. But IEP teams do need to be planning to assess what was the impact of both the building closures that initially happened last school year and the ongoing closures that um, contribute to our remote learning experience. 
IEP teams have just some tips to think about. IEP teams have an opportunity to decide that a reevaluation may be needed to get the most up-to-date information and essentially reassess where is the student's level of need at currently. And if that happens, timelines are in effect and they should be followed to the, the maximum extent possible if we're still in a remote sort of situation using safety precautions that are available. Uh, next slide, some more tips that maybe a, you as a family could particularly try to take away to think about. Start tracking any progress that you see being made or lack of progress due to services missed during the hybrid or remote learning situation that you're in. And it's okay to ask your IEP team for support or training on how to do progress monitoring. This means asking perhaps for a rubric or some sort of guidelines, certain things to look for that demonstrate that a student is uh, showing an emerging skill or able to maintain a particular skill or something to work on to kind of monitor that this is an indication that a skill uh, that, we're, that we're continuing to develop may need additional attention. And IEPs do have progress reporting schedules. So it's important to try to stick to that so that there is a checking point with your IEP team or you're getting communication with your IEP team about where the student is at on a particular goal. If it has been addressed, or if it has not been addressed, it sh there still should be a progress report being available as to, as to providing like a marker as to where you are in that situation. It's okay to continue add the idea or topic of recovery services as an agenda item, say to any IEP team meeting you might attend. And to try to capture any ideas that get essentially tabled for later discussion, make sure that gets captured either in a follow-up email with your district IEP team or have the district make sure that that's captured in any kind of notes or written records, sometimes called a prior written notice following your meeting. So this collection of ideas is important and to not lose track of that because the conversation about recovery services we hope and expect will be ongoing as we start to transition back into the classrooms. And as we start to fit within the existing timelines of the IEP, because you still have an annual IEP meeting, you still have a three year reevaluation that's expected to be followed. Recovery services is now one of those topic or touch or points to discuss. Next slide. And right now, as we're going forward, something that, that may help in prioritizing what is important for recovery services now versus later is to pinpoint what are the critical skills. Um, there were some very important questions about reading, for instance, that were submitted in advance. Um, reading, no doubt, is a critical skill. And if that muscle is not exercised, if that's a skill that's not continually practice, um, there's a real ripple effect. So prioritizing critical skills with your IEP team is important and something that can be done. There can be temporary IEP amendments to address certain critical skills, to kind of block off time to address a skill in whatever format the IEP team may or may not decide is necessary. And this is where I've, we've already mentioned you might want to plan for a reevaluation to reset a baseline or get additional information about what a student needs are and plan for also later assessments if necessary. And importantly enough, many families have been able to get private, privately obtained services or evaluations. Please share that with your school districts. Any piece of data or information can be used to consider this is where the student is at and how much recovery services or how we're gonna address learning loss. And just a quick note that you see at the, the bottom of the screen, 
that districts are not necessarily required to be re reimbursing families for private providers, but that private providers though, any information that families have obtained is still certainly valuable. And kind of along that same uh, trend, just want to, to remind everyone that there may be there may be options of, that are going to be offered to all students. There should be some, uh, some that term I used earlier, universal screening, that as students are preparing to come back into the school or, or they're increasing the amount of in-person, um, to have, uh, to, to, to kind of reset that baseline for all students. Um, and that we, we want to make sure that students with disabilities have access to, to those processes as well. Um, and if there are uh, additional learning opportunities that are being provided, or maybe some summer sessions, uh, there was a question about extended school year. Certainly extended school year, uh, if the student meets the criteria for that, if, if, if it's a matter of uh, looking at um, the amount of, of learning that the student may, may lose over that time off from school, then that that meets the criteria for extended school year. Some systems might be offering more general summer options and summer supports. And so that is certainly something that families can be um, asking for students to be a part of as well. Uh, anything Lee or, or Scott to add around that, around the summer questions? No, I think that's, that's an option to plan for if it's available within your district. And I think asking those kind of questions is critical. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, I'll, kind of related to, to this, several of the questions um, that came in uh, are specifically around this webinar tonight, but, but also just questions that we've been getting in our office uh, are around our students who are older. Um, and so particularly students who were turning 21 uh, during the school facility closure time or over this school year. And so what we know is that the ability of many of our schools and districts to provide adequate transition services was interrupted by COVID. Uh, that happened last year and in many locations that that's an ongoing problem. And so we are requesting that the state legislature provide up to $12 million uh, over two years. So over 21-22 and then over 22-23 to extend transition services to students with disabilities who, who are already over that age of 21. So they've turned 21 either during the 2019-20 or 2021 school years. They did not yet graduate with a regular diploma. Uh, and the, the IEP team determines that they need those recovery services on or after July 1st. So we'll, uh, if this moves forward, we're working with the legislature right now to, to look at whether this can be part of the budget. Um, and then uh, there will be some, some funding available to support that work. All right, Lee, I was gonna um, transition a little bit to some questions we received around inclusion. Uh, are there any um, further discussions we wanna have uh, specific to recovery? I think we're okay. Okay, thank you. So several of the questions that were specific to inclusion, um, we're really asking uh, around how do we make sure that students are not um, being pulled out of general education more than they need to because uh, of small groups? Um, what strategies have been really helping to make sure that students with disabilities can be included. What types of trainings our teachers have access to uh, in support of inclusion and universal design for learning? And how families can, can get support uh, around helping their students uh, and also helping with, with IEP goals and with inclusion. So we, are in the second year of a two-year project called the Inclusionary Practices Project. Um, and, you know, Washington really has been on this journey uh, and it started before COVID. Uh, I think some, some of the, the 
um, questions that have come in tonight on the Q&A and in the chat um, focused on the, the, the reality that a lot of these concerns predate the pandemic um, and have only been made um, more difficult in the time since. So in 2018, Washington was ranked 44th out of 50 states for inclusive practices. In 2019, the state legislature funded this project. It's $25 million project over two years. And its focus is around providing uh, professional development and training to public school teachers in support of inclusion. And so our goal by 2021 was to uh, reach a 60% rate of inclusion for students who are in general education classes for most of their day, meaning for 80 to 100% of their school day. And in targeted pilot schools that have had lower levels of inclusion, the target was uh, to get to 50%. Well, we've met or exceeded both of those as of December, 2020. Still have a long way to go. Uh, this is an ongoing um, priority for us. But what we can share is that this, this has translated into 5,000 students with disabilities in Washington, moving up to that highest tier of inclusion. And so I wanted to share uh, and make sure that, that partners on tonight's call were aware of some of the resources. So we, we have multiple partners that we're working with, uh, but there are some that are um, really, really working to include families and to support families in this work. So there's the Family Engagement Collaborative, and they are offering um, webinars, trainings for, for educators uh, to support their work in, in working with families, uh, and also some direct trainings for families. And so their new website is linked in here. We're also working with the University of Washington Herring Center for Inclusive Practices, and they are our partners um, in helping, helping other schools and, and, and partners in the community learn more about inclusive schools. So they are working with four preschool sites and 12 sites that are um, from K-12 that are, are, are already implementing inclusive practices. And, and so there are videos that parents can watch um, and other resources to look at. And then um, there were a few questions that came in uh, around discipline. Um, and at really helping students with the, the social emotional learning and, and positive behavior supports. And so we, one of our partners is Collaborative Learning Solutions, and they're really focused on restorative practices uh, and how that connects with inclusion for students with disabilities. And then for our partners who are interested in learning more about transition and career and technical education, our partners at the Center for Change and Transition Services are doing a lot of work to help school teams work together on that. We're also um, publishing, we're rolling out in chapters, uh, an inclusionary practices handbook. So we've had the, the introduction and chapter one has already come out. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll be rolling out chapter two. We're just in the final stages of getting that ready for posting. And so these resources are free. Uh, there's no cost for any of the trainings that we talked about, and there's, there's no cost for the materials. All right, so I'm gonna uh, keep us moving uh, because I do wanna make sure that we, we touch on the themes uh, that were, were presented. Uh, I did see a question come through about whether we're still taking questions. I would say, please keep sending them. Uh, we, we will use these to either uh, respond to you directly or create um, a, a summary document that we can post along with tonight's video. Uh, we also, these are really helpful questions for us to think about our, our guidance materials and, and how we need, need to be um, being as transparent as possible when we're creating materials. So please just keep them coming, even if we aren't able to get to every question tonight. So family supports, Lee, I think you're gonna talk us through a little bit of a, a few of these strategies. Yeah, just in, I think just good things to think about in general as we're supporting um, home learning, right? I think um, I'm, a, I'm a parent of two of two children in, in the public education system. I, you know, work for OSPI full time, and I've had my children in my house all all year, uh, also going to school remotely, and um, it it has been a, a thing, as it has been for all of you as well. Um, how much we try and do, as much as you can. There's no part in burning yourself out 
uh, not taking care of yourself to meet the, the, the asynchronous academic goals of your student. You need to take care of yourself and your family first as your first priority. Next. You can just go down the hole, yeah. I mean, I think the thing to remember is that learning at home is valuable. The embedding your children in your routine has an incredible value. And you can do inclusion in your home. You, you can have your, your, your child access activities um, with their same age peers uh, in your home in ways they, they actually can't usually do in the school day. Being in your house and seeing what you do and seeing how you do your job and seeing how you run your home is really important. And uh, th there is incredible value to what's going on right now for our families and communities. Next. Just Dr. Bruce Perry is a hero of mine and um, you know, uh, wrote a book really, the, I think what I consider the seminal book on, on surviving trauma and students and youth surviving trauma called um, My Life's um, Boy Was Raised as a Dog. It really is an incredible book about understanding complex trauma. And he really recommends a few things. I think there's six of these or seven total. So structure your day, really have a plan, have an organization, have family meals, um, limit media as much as we can. Everyone should be exercising all the time. Uh, uh, as much as we can to, to keep our, our, our bodies and brains healthy, reaching out and connecting with others, offering to help others. These are all skills you can build in your home with your kids, teaching them how to reach out, how to connect. Even though it's in a virtual world, these are incredible skills you can help them build live all the time. Right? Practicing good sleep, having, having a bedtime is important as much as I was, I've reluctantly learned to believe that in my old age. I have um, come, to come to grips with it as a former night owl. Um, and staying positive and future focused. I think remembering that this is all gonna be over and there, there will be something like a new normal eventually. And next. These are all behaviors that you're probably seeing in your home and these are normal. This is what's happening. This is what's happening to children because of the pandemic that's going on. They're crying and arguing more. They're falling back on old habits and old behaviors. They're sleeping and eating patterns have changed. They're overdosing on screen time. They're clinging to you a lot, even though you may be spending even more time with them. I know that I, uh, I stare at a screen a lot during the day. And um, if I'm not really present for my kids at night, if I'm, I'm staring at another screen, uh, they know they're there. And I feel like, I'm like, you guys have been here all day. How come, I feel like I see you all the time. And they're like, no, we don't have, we don't have connected. You know, we, don't, we don't have that connection. We don't, it's not intentional. Right, even though it feels overwhelming all the time. But these are all behaviors that you're gonna see in your kids. And these are normative. These are things that should be seen and should be assumed. So they're not cause for concern as much as they are things that are happening right now that we have to address as they're, as they're going on. And then I think just in general, my, I, my overarching philosophy, I think if you're, if, you have, if you're struggling with behaviors in your home or you're seeing increased behaviors as you go back to school or increased behaviors in the home going back to school or increased behaviors at school after going back to school. Things are really, because things are different and change is hard and this requires a new skill set. That the thing to remember is that challenging kids are, are challenging because they lack the skills not to be challenging. Kids do well if they can. If they had the skills to do well, they'd be doing well. They're lacking skills. What are those skills? And that's our job to figure that out. When they display challenging behaviors, they, it's because they are the demands placed on them exceed their ability to, per, to access them, to, to respond adaptively. When we treat behavioral challenging kids if they have a developmental delay, imagine that we treat kids who are having behavioral challenges as if, we, as if they had another sort of, uh, had a learning disability, how radically different things would be. Right? I think we can encourage our, our the, the more we build relationships with our school districts and with our, our school buildings, we can foster that idea in our schools. Right? Uh, that's, that's something, a huge thing I'm trying to work on all the time is really shifting that philosophy away from punishment and more towards skill building. So I think that's something to think about. Like, wait, if, if, if this kid, if your kid is in your house and you see increased behaviors, figure out why they can't behave the way you'd like them to. What is the skill they're missing? And I, I in the heat of the moment, I forget that a lot, but I try to preach it as much as I can all the time. That's it, thank you. I just want thanks. You know. <laughs> thanks, Lee. Um, th there was a question uh, that had been submitted as well that was um, a, a kind of a specialized question. It was around, what, what uh, resources there might be for foster families who are um, newly connected with, with a student with autism. And so there, there are, we would encourage you to call our office if you wanna learn a little bit more or talk with us. Um, we're also sharing a resource from Children's uh, that's uh, it, to support parents of, of children with autism. Um, and it's, it's an Autism 101. 
Uh, so that link is there if that was your question or uh, if it's something that you want to learn a little bit more about. And so I, I'm seeing a lot of questions, I think, still kind of coming in or, or have been uh, in the Q&A around the, the IEP. Um, and we'll, we'll walk through some of the themes uh, that we got. Scott may jump in a little bit uh, to talk with me about evaluations and IEPs uh, in that section, but I'll start a little bit uh, with continuing the theme around engagement uh, that Lee started for us. So, you know, what, what we would encourage is trans a transparent and engaging evaluation process. Uh, that process should center the student uh, and family voice and focus on the student's strengths and assets. Um, also, we, we, there, isn't, there, there aren't only certain categories that we're gonna look for, right? Scott talked about, you know, we may need to think about a reevaluation and we might need to explore new areas that might, might not have been part of what we were working on with the student before, but now the situation has changed. And so the evaluation process can really help us uncover that uh, and determine how to best support the student. In the IEP team meetings, um, making sure that we're sharing, sharing discussions, um, sharing decisions, and really thinking about inclusionary practices. Um, again, universal design for learning, someone had asked us about that. Uh, thinking about accommodations that allow the student to be uh, included in general education. And then when we're developing IEP goals, aligning those to the grade level standard. The student may not be able to achieve that standard yet, but how are we working toward that? And how are we thinking about that grade level standard uh, in, the, in the work that we're doing? Do families have opportunities to participate in trainings? Um, are, they, are, are your school districts helping you learn how to be uh, an advocate and how to um, be able to support inclusive practices? And then it's so important to think about coordination and linkages with outside agencies. Um, families, right now have so much on their shoulders. They, they always have, and right now um, that load is heavier than ever. Um, and so there, there may be some supports even outside of the school district that families can be accessing. And when that happens, that's great. We also wanna make sure that those are, are being coordinated with what's happening in the school. Oops, sorry about that. And so for evaluations and IEPs, uh, do you want to walk us through this briefly, Scott? I know we only have a few more minutes. Right. This is Scott speaking again. Thank you. I, this would be, yes, uh, basically a reminder that we still have structures in place uh, that can be followed to the extent possible. Um, and school districts are trying to do that. And you can rely upon that and still ask those kind of questions of your IEP teams. This goes back to what we already spoke about with respect to monitoring the progress and being able to share the information that you have. Um, there's still, if you see, uh, as Tanya just mentioned, kind of new areas cropping up. Um, not only would this be something to raise with your IEP team, but if you have a student who is, is not eligible for special education services, um, this could be a time to potentially make that request to consider an evaluation. Um, and as we already reiterated a number of times, the, the coordination with the team about how to assess and look for information that can be used to determine kind of the next steps in terms of assessment or evaluation, um, that would be possible. And evaluations may look a little different because we're in the middle of a pandemic. And there may be different ways to take observational data, either using technology or health and safety protocol to plan for um, certain types of observations or assessments to take place. Those kind of protocol and decisions really can be made together with an IEP team and there is some flexibility in this to work with your school district. Next slide. Okay. 
and going forward to still remember that IP services are still expected to be implemented to the maximum extent possible. Those services can be delivered as creatively as, as anyone can come up with online, in person, or now a lot of us are moving, a lot of school districts are moving to hybrid learning kind of models. And one thing to keep an eye out for as a family when you're having these discussions is to reiterate the value for inclusion, that any kind of decisions made about how students are going to be grouped, particularly in hybrid learning situations, or even in remote learning situation, you could address the opportunities to have students be in the appropriate placement based on the student's needs. And if services need to be adapted, IEP amendments are still uh, a mechanism to capture kind of what the IEP team's thinking might be around the most appropriate way to address student needs at this moment. And always, you know, the monitoring of progress is something that OSPI has gone back to over and over again in conversations with school districts. You know, how do we keep track of what's going on and how do we use that information to plan for the future? Families have a really value-added value voice in that process and being able to ask your IEP team for training and support on how to monitor progress yourself and get your observations into the conversation is what's needed now as we come around on almost a year of this kind of uh, pandemic. Annual IEP meetings are going to be happening on a regular basis. Your voices is extremely valuable in the revisions as IEPs go forward. Thanks, Scott. I know that we are at time. Um, if, you, if you need to move on with your evening, we certainly respect that. Um, we have just two more slides and they're related to special education monitoring, which I, I, I feel like some of you may, may have interest in this system over, the, over this next year. So if you're able to stay for maybe just five more minutes, I'll do my best to, to wrap this section up quickly. Uh, but I wanted everyone to understand that we felt it was very important to continue special education monitoring over this year. We're um, doing it safely. So we have a combination of uh, districts we're monitoring, uh, which, uh, which, which is called a desk review. That, that we, we always had that in process. And so we wouldn't go on site to those school districts. Those are districts that their data show less risk. Um, for districts that we would normally have gone on to the, the site and done school visits, we're doing virtual visits this year. Uh, we're also trying to, to uh, use different modalities. So there's, there are kind of two components to the monitoring. We have district and school reviews, and they're what we're really looking at is continuous improvement. We're, we're digging into data. We're looking for evidence of family and community input. And there are also several monitoring areas that we look at. We look at child find, which is that evaluation piece. We looked at least restrictive environment and inclusion, early childhood, secondary transition, discipline and disproportionality. That is looking at, um, is there over-representation by race and ethnicity in different special education uh, indicators? We are also doing student file reviews. And Scott mentioned um, that we're coming up on a year. Uh, we definitely see the impact of COVID in the, the IEPs that we're looking at. Uh, we're lo we look at present levels. We review the students' goals. We look at progress over time. We collect multiple progress reports. We also conduct service provider interviews. Um, and for those virtual visits, we're looking into how to do some instructional observations. Uh, even it, over the, the remote learning so that we can look at the provision of specially designed instruction in those environments. We're also piloting this year an educational benefit review. Um, and what that's really trying to look at is the student's progress over time, not just a snapshot of how that student's doing this year, but looking at a three-year trend, looking from one evaluation to the next, all of the IEPs in between, and looking at the progress reports as well. 
And then the last thing I wanted to just make sure that you were aware of in terms of the monitoring. Uh, we are also, we conduct administrator interviews. I talked about the service provider interviews. Uh, we'll be doing some focus group and work sessions with staff uh, uh, over Zoom. We'll also be doing parent surveys and then parent interviews as well so that we can talk with families in these school districts and hear from them directly. When we have parent permission, we will also conduct student interviews. Uh, I talked about observations. And then in systems that have these other entities, we'll also do interviews with private schools, non-public agencies, uh, and also institutions if there's one in that region. So thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for the time tonight. Um, someone recommended that we uh, keep the list of questions and include those along with the slides and we can do that. Um, we will make sure that there's nothing personal uh, in the questions that, that we include, but we can include a summary of them uh, at the back of the, the PDF and, and we'll post that when we post this recording that will have the captions. So I'll pause there, see if Scott or Lee has any final thoughts or questions. Um, and then if you would like to connect with our, our office directly, we, we welcome that. Um, and so we're happy to share that contact information uh, if anyone needs it. That was a busy Q&A. Thank you everyone for your questions. I love it. This was great. I, I hope that you found uh, that we, we touched on at least some of the questions you had on your minds. We really have an interest in doing this ongoing so that we can hear directly from families. And so, um, you know, if you're interested in that, I, I hope that you'll let us know so that we, we, know, um, we know you're very busy and this is a, a time of, of evening when you're, you're juggling multiple things, but we so value your participation. All right, um, I think we can stop the recording now and uh, everyone have a fantastic